Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. That's Yen Schiphol. And that's Steve Jones. And Jens, today on the program, I'm really excited about our guests. I get excited about a lot of our guests, and really the, the, the fact that our guests take the time to talk is always really great, but but this is a really fun one. Um, so uh, Sounds good, yeah. I mean, Steve, just in general, you can, you're kind of an excitable person. You know, it's easy for you to get excited about all sorts of things. Doesn't take a lot, right? But No, no, it doesn't take a lot. Ooh, sunny day, look at that. It's yeah. so exciting, I'm pretty- Squirrel! Yeah, pretty stoked. Ah, uh, oh, squirrel, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, no, but today, Jens, we have uh, Jeremiah Freitz from the Lumineers on the program. Nice, welcome. Yes, so this is, uh, this is a fun one. So uh, I got this interview uh, because Jeremiah is putting out a, uh, a solo album, aside from the Lumineers, um, and it's called Piano Piano. It comes out January 22nd. Um, I had a chance to uh, hear it before the interview, and uh, it's really pretty cool right it's not something i would normally seek out but just hearing you know his uh his kind of stories through his music is is pretty awesome that's cool that's really really cool you know i've always made you have probably more knowledge of this than i do but i've always wondered you know what it's like when someone in a band decides to go and do a solo album what's that like what is it what is that like for that uh you know individual and what is it like for the rest of the band members like you know you yeah. could think of it maybe as you know, do the rest of the, I'll just use the Lumineers as an example. Like, does the rest of the band feel like, oh, whatever, a splitter, do your own thing, you know, come back in a year, or it's like, oh my God, we're so sick of Jeremiah, I can't wait, just get him out of here for a year, he could do his thing and then come back. <laughs> you know, like, well, how does the dynamic go? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's different levels of, of that, right? Um, if, right. <laughs> if the band is waiting on you, let's take Blink-182, for example, and Tom, right. DeLong, Tom DeLong that went off to chase UFOs, Right. Uh, they weren't very cool with that. Uh, you know, they were waiting on him to to get together, make new music, play shows and everything. And he just couldn't commit um, to, to doing that. So I think that's a little different. I think as long as the communication is there, you know, there, yeah. there's no uh, conflict of contracts or yeah. anything uh, along those yeah, lines. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Sure it's OK if, if the time allows it, unless it's taking away from you know, the work that they need to do on, on the, the right. primary. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That, that totally makes sense. I mean, as long as it's, um, uh, you know, aligned with the, with the band's, you know, ultimate goals and visions, you know, and then roadmap basically, um, you know, another person we talk about a lot is, is Tom Petty, you know, and he's definitely done mm -hmm. his own solo work. Um, you know, he's done, he's done work with other musicians and, uh, released albums like the whole traveling Wilburys thing that he did. Um, but you know, it's always been Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Dave Grohl, another another one, right? I mean, he's he's been on so, like so many artists' albums, and he's just always game for whatever yeah. is happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know, uh, so he's a, he's another one, but he always comes home to Foo Fighters, doesn't he? So uh, right. I don't think. And, so and I love that. I love that. You know, I think, and maybe part of what I'm saying is part of me kind of worries is worries about what's going to happen to the rest of the band. I mean, does this mean they're going to break up? Are they not doing well? You know what? What does this mean? <laughs> well, I'm sure they have the same liberty to go off and do, you know, their own thing. Whether they take advantage of that is a, uh, a different thing. And obviously it's yeah, a lot yeah. easier to slide in and slide out when you're Dave Grohl versus, you know, when you're uh, Taylor Hawkins, the drummer of the Foo Fighters. Although I'm sure so many would be great, you know, yeah. happy to yeah, have yeah. him on their album. And he himself has a side band, um, yeah. Chuck Metal. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve, before we get into our stories, yes. I have to ask you a question. This is a very important question, so I want you to listen very carefully. I'm listening carefully. Do you have your brewski? I don't. It's the middle of the day, so I'm going to water. Uh, Dude, it's, it's after 12 o'clock p.m. It is brewski time. I should, I should, right? But I, I dropped the ball on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am disappointed. I'm, I'm hanging up. Okay. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you got a story to share. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about. I mean, there's a there's two stories, right? First, um, I went out. I'll, I'll keep the first one brief, and then we can talk more about what you know we did um, yesterday, even right. But the first was I um, I went out hunting at um, at Delavan. I don't think I shared this this story uh, on the most recent pod, but. Um, I think we talked about you going there. We might have not talked about how it was. 
Okay, uh, so I went out hunting um, last week with um, at Delavan, uh, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was it was great. I got a good lottery, and uh, we were able to get on um, uh, in a good in a relatively good spot. Uh, my buddy John, who I was hunting with, he dropped me off, you know, um, on the side of the road, and I trekked in to um, a spot that we had hunted in the past, so it was marked on my map. Um, I got there really easily. The spot didn't exist anymore, though. Um, oh, what? It was taken, or know, did they so build a building there, or what do you mean? The Thule, <laughs> they put up a building, I just crashed right into it. Uh, they, uh, the the toolies that you have to brush into and kind of hide in were gone, and there were, I mean, in a lot of the pond, there were like a foot and a half tall toolies, which, um, which where there would had been open water before. So imagine I'm going to shoot a, a bird. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to shoot a duck, right? And um, it goes down, but I don't see exactly where it lands. Even in a foot and a half tall, it might as well be ten feet tall because right. because you, if you don't spot exactly where it goes down you don't, you're going to have a hard time finding that bird. And That's where a dog comes in handy. A dog would be very good in that situation. You've got a dog, man. I have a new dog. We can, we can train these two together. I think they'd be great. And <laughs> I think we need something somewhere in the middle of yours and mine. Yours on the, a little on the young side, a little on the small side, mine a little on the old side, a little on the big side. Uh, neither of them really bred for uh, for hunting. Uh, so. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, right. it would be pure comedy and probably piss everybody else off. It's, it's, it's out there. I would I would imagine that's the case. Yeah. So your your dog would probably you'd lose your dog just as well as you lose a duck in the, in the mark, definitely. So. Yeah. 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 So um, are you saying that the water level was low or like why did this happen? The water's fine. So it was overgrown and uh, like they didn't oh, plow. Overgrown. Yeah, they didn't clean it, plow it uh, in the off season like they normally would. I mean, I'm sure them in a lot of places are using COVID as an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but that. Yeah, yeah, right. You wouldn't want to be out in nature, uh, I know. you know, mowing a lawn or field of tulies. It was, it, and so that was an issue. You, you saw people, I saw people as we were hunting, right, that shot a bird and didn't see exactly where it landed and uh -oh. walking around for half an hour or something trying to find the bird and it's just like okay <laughs> you're not going to find it if you didn't see it so right. still moving a little bit uh so that was challenging and then i'm also a little bit directionally challenged so i had a hard time finding one of the backup spots that you're fine we were trying to find because i couldn't follow it on the map where i was moving to it's just it's a problem um but we eventually found a spot um i did not shoot any birds in the spot that we found, uh, but uh, and I, you know, I missed taking a shot at some mallards, which you know my duck, the duck I want to bring home this season is a Drake mallard. I just want one, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so I missed it, taking a shot at a couple because they were coming in and going towards John, and I didn't want to shoot over him. Mm -hmm. But I probably could have shot him safely. I didn't though. Um, John shot shoot the two duck or shoot John. I didn't shoot either. Uh, I'm proud to, proud to say. Uh, yeah, so John shot two spoonies and then it was, uh, you know, the dry point of the morning. So we, you know, some people had moved and so we moved like 60 yards away. And as soon as we got set up in the new spot, these two uh, um, pintail came in slowly and I, you know, I was moving um, our decoys on a jerk rig, like, so there's some movement on the water. And, um, you know, and I, I told John, he's like just well, don't shoot yet uh I, you know i waited and then i you know when it was time like i shot i shot the first one and he shot the second one it was this great like they both went down uh and on the other side of our toolies and stone we found them immediately like you know and then fist bumped them because we're uh -huh. keeping uh -huh. cool. and everything. <laughs> but, uh -huh. just so exciting it was a perfect pass and i was uh i was happy to bring home a good awesome so. cool 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 Good, uh, good adventure. And uh, this week, and uh, you're sitting out, right? But you've got plans on going again to the same spot next week. Next weekend, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm gonna go out with my brother next weekend and um, and hopefully get a good lottery because you know I don't have a reservation, um, mm -hmm. but maybe we'll get lucky and um, and be able to get in. You know, now I have a better idea of kind of where we'll be able to drop in with uh, mm -hmm. and find a spot pretty quickly if I do get a 
good lottery pull. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fingers crossed cool. for that. Yay, yeah. good, good. And you survived the whole um, sleeping in the car thing and not freezing to death. It's like second nature now, as long as I don't have too much stuff in my car, it's not that bad. I just crawl into a sleeping bag and, you know, have a couple pillows and sleep mm -hmm. on it for five or six hours until it's time to get up. So yeah, that's, I mean, it's even better sleeping there than in my own bed. So ah, nice. Yeah. You know what, for me, uh, now that we're in the season where it's getting colder, you know, it's not like the low is, you know, 68 anymore, you know, it's going down to 37. I think is what I saw yesterday and uh, kudos to you, man. Maybe I'm a wimp, but it's, it, it can get cold, but you know, my sleeping bag keeps me pretty warm and I'll, you know, and I'll bring some layers too. So if I need to, but I was actually, there's, 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 there's always that, 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 that thing where, you know, it's, it's 2.30 AM and you've got to pee, you know, it's like, oh my God, oh my God, am I going to hold it? Am I going to hold it? Or I'm going to like crawl out of my sleeping bag and like pee and. I'm just going to sit and think about it for the next 40 minutes, pretend, you know, to go back to sleep. <laughs> Not going to be a problem. That does happen, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Good times. So, um, before we get into the interview, let's talk briefly. Yesterday, uh, it, this is the, our Thanksgiving week episode. So, um, you were awesome. And, you know, against all recommendations from our government, we, you had a friends gathering. Uh, <laughs> we did have a friends gathering. Yeah. Uh, in all fairness, uh, you know, all of this. COVID shit kind of went down after we planned this whole thing. Uh, so we had in the back of our minds, you know, full expectations that we were probably going to have to just cancel it, um, you know, either because uh, the COVID situation would get so bad that it wasn't safe to do that anymore, or because, you know, the weather has been shitty and it, it was just going to be raining. And the only way we we're going to do this was, you know, to do it safely outside and no one wants to do that in the rain. Uh, but we, we ended up having awesome weather and we had, uh, you know, enough people, but few enough to make the social distancing work really well uh, in the backyard and on the patio and stuff. Um, and people were really good with their masks um, yeah. for the most part. Um, so it was thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. I mean, everybody's faced at least like 15 feet apart from each other, you know, and mm -hmm. You know, goes up. Yeah, I mean, you you had a good spread of food. I mean, you had a turkey, you had a ham. Like you you brought up the ham, and then we we're all like, "Oh, awesome, great!" We didn't even know a turkey was coming out. You know, like <laughs> yeah, Damon was in the kitchen cutting the whole thing. He's like a you know the chef guy, and uh, and I didn't realize, and this happens every year. I didn't realize exactly how much food we had until it was all out. Was like, yeah, we made a lot of food. You had a good amount of food, but it, every I think everybody left happy, and uh, you you. Mm -hmm. came you know, you have some leftovers, so you'll be eating fine. Yeah, that, you know. that's going to be nice. Yeah, it's going to be turkey until, you know, through the whole Thanksgiving week. And I'm going to do like the turkey carcass soup uh, uh, this year. I skipped out on it last year because it just ends up being too much. And we know we could never finish it all. And it takes up too much room in the freezer and stuff. But I'm going to try it a little differently. I'm not going to take the whole, uh, you know, turkey carcass and roast it again. Uh, so it's all nice and crispy and then I'll make the stock out of that. Um, and this time I'll actually uh, do the noodle part. Um, I've, uh, in the past, it's been more like a stew with potatoes and stuff, but this time it's gonna be more of a traditional, uh, you know, like chicken soup, except with turkey, roasted yeah. turkey. Well, I like it, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm not, to it. yeah, I'm not, it's, I don't even, this is the first Thanksgiving, I'm not, I don't have any family that I'm gonna be seeing or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I and the kids are going to be with their mom, and so I'm like, okay, well, we'll get, we'll get a dinner, you know, br you know, d out or something. You know, we're not eating out or anything. Mm. Get something to bring home and keep it relatively simple, but you know, have a good dinner together. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and then look forward to next year, hopefully, right? So. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fingers crossed to next year. Uh, yeah, and to kind of end that story, um, after the. Uh, after the dinner, uh, have, let's see, it started at about two o'clock, ended at about 6.45 or so. And I really didn't think people would stay more than maybe two, two and a half hours, but um, it was warm enough and um, it was light long enough where people ended up staying longer, which was nice. Um, but then after the whole thing was over and after we were done you know, cleaning everything, um, my dad FaceTimes me, right? Yeah, and so my first- Hours, yeah. My first thought was like, oh my God, I'm glad we didn't, 
plan this pod for last night because I would have been on my dad with for an hour and a half and then you know, yeah. it would have been forever. We would have been really tired and you know, it would have sucked. But um, dude, so depressing. Uh-oh. So we're uh, we're canceling our trip to go to Seattle next week. No, what happened? Yeah. Uh, well, he's at the retirement home and they have a they have a lockdown more or less. None of the residents there are allowed to see anyone for the next four weeks. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No one's allowed to uh, be on campus that doesn't live there or work there. Um, and uh, they're not allowed to go out and see their families and stuff. I mean, they're not, they can't really police that, but I mean, there's yeah. a purpose behind it, you know, and to remain safe. And I'd feel horrible, you know, if, if we caught something on the way over there and, you know, pass it on to them and their high risk group. And so we're like, oh, fuck it, you know, so <laughs> it sucks. Oh, no, cheers, man. It it sucks, it's it's fun. This shit never ends, dude. I haven't seen this. I haven't seen my dad all year. Yeah, and you're used to go. I mean, you usually go up once a month, once every month and a half, something like that. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we usually see each other a couple of times. You know, he'll come down, I'll go up. Uh, it's kind of more regular, but now, um, it's like I mean, I've never. This is the longest period of time I've never not seen him. Yeah. Um, and the older he gets, you know, the more important it is, you know, to to to, to see him more and more often, and. Uh, and it's like, I mean, this is one of the reasons I'm so fucking sick of this virus. It's not just being, you know, locked inside your house. You know, it's not being able to see all those loved ones that, you know, live too far away and are in these special situations. And I mean, I know there, I don't want to get too depressing, but I know there's so many people out there too that are not allowed to see their loved ones who are ill, they're sick, they're dying, they've died. So they hard. Say goodbye. You know, fucking hell. Some, you know, someone you're closest with like is in the hospital yeah. and dying. Can't even be there on their deathbed. Yeah. I mean, and, and and then the patient, the loved one who's sick, mm-hmm. basically dies alone. Yeah. That's the worst of it. Not a way to go. You know, yeah. I just I'm hopeful for next year, 2021, right around the corner. Yes. I started looking up. Fun. <laughs> yeah. So should we bring we should. Guest? We should, we should. Good. Jeremy Freights from the Lumineers had a great chat with him. I will preface as well that uh, his internet was a little spotty in his home. And so there, are, you know, I'll do my best to clean it up, but uh, there are points where you're gonna hear him cut out a little bit probably. And, uh, but really, really great chat. We talked for almost an hour and, uh, and really happy with this one. So uh, let's bring Jeremiah Freitz in. Yeah. How are you doing, Jeremiah? Like, I mean, this is a crazy time we're in right now, right? Like. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm a little bit jet lagged. I just um, a couple of days ago, my wife and son are over there still. I'm just back to work, to work on some stuff, Lumineer stuff. So it's a crazy time. The election's happening today. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, you, uh, I mean, you kind of hit on it, right? But you recently moved uh, to Italy, right? And so tell me about um, what spawned that move and, uh, you know, and also, I mean, kind of coming back to the U.S. during this, you know. Uh, the election. Sure. So the spawn of the move was basically my wife, Francesca, is from Torino, Italy, originally. And we've been together, I think, about seven or eight years now. And we'd always go there about two or three times a year if we were lucky in between Lumineers touring and stuff. And I've always loved Europe. I've always loved the idea to move there. And then I feel like with regards to the Lumineers and how me and the singer Wes, how we write, uh, I think we were able to figure that out long distance. Um, it seemed like I was actually able to do it, which was sort of like a dream come true. So about two months ago, we moved there. House there in Torino, Italy, and I'm really excited by that. Um, it's interesting because like watching the TV at night, for example, um, you'll see a lot of like American news, you know, and think, you'll see a lot of Trump they will say something in English and quickly it's like overdubbed in Italian, but you can usually tell it's not really presented in like a positive light because that's his style, <laughs> so to speak. And it's been interesting watching the country from afar. I mean, less than a month ago, the country was quite literally burning, you know, with the actual fires. And then in my opinion, politically, politically, the country is also kind of burning too and being torn apart at the seams where uh, I don't think I realized 
I knew the country was divided, but watching the, if you Google the election results 2020, and you look at, for example, Michigan, I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands of votes difference. And in a presidential election, I mean, you might as well say that's like one or two more votes to get the win. So the country's still terribly divided, more so than I thought. I thought we were already terribly divided, but it's even worse or more than I thought. And, you know, watching America from, from Italy, ironically, it makes me, I don't know, like more proud to be an American. And just, I love, I'm 34 and I was born and raised in this country. Um, and something about leaving it makes you to appreciate the things that, um, I think sometimes when you live here and especially in this political climate, it's easy to complain. It's easy to say, I wish I could like, I'm going to Canada. You know, a lot of people have joked about that. A lot of people have done that too. And I think I thought when I went to Italy, I think I, I might've thought um, that uh, I would feel indifferent to the country or something. And in fact, I feel like I, I, I'm rooting for America more. I really wanna make sure that um, the country succeeds and that we get leadership that this country deserves, so. Yeah, yeah. So do you feel like, uh, I mean, ha you haven't been in Italy that long, but do you feel like you're already starting to connect with, um, you know, a different political nature in uh, in Italy at this point? Or? No, I wouldn't say. I mean, I, I don't speak the language, so it's hard to understand what's going on. And I haven't been there long enough to really like acclimate to a political sphere, so to speak. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so let's go back. I want to, I mean, just one of the most interesting things kind of, as I was kind of prepared for this interview for me is, so, is that you were kind of raised on, uh, on classical music, right? You and your, uh, your brother, and you were kind of uh, competitive over Mozart and Beethoven and, and that's, yeah. you don't hear that a lot, you know? Uh, so tell me about what that child what it was like from a uh, perspective of growing up in a household like that. I just remember, um, my mom bought me this cassette tape. It was a cassette and it was at the store called Bradley's, which was like a low level kind of Kmart. It was like a random store, like a, just a store in Ramsey, New Jersey, where I grew up. And she bought me the sonatas and it was, sonatas are just piano versions of the, the classical songs. And it was sonatas with nature sounds. So it was like, and it was Beethoven. So it was his song, Ode to Joy with like ocean sounds and, you know, Moonlight Sonata with, I don't know, birds chirping in the back, things like that. And I, I mean, I, I must have listened to that every night going to sleep for years. I probably wore out the tape and that was my, that was like my first, I guess, artist that I really, really connected with. It was just very peaceful. I was very fascinated by the piano. I don't think I understood what was happening. It just did something to me psychologically that I was drawn to. And then my brother, on the other hand, he really liked, um, I, I think it was Mozart. Yeah, it was, he liked Mozart more. And I was like, nah, man, Mozart stinks. Like it's Beethoven all the way. And I really felt that at the time. Now, obviously it's like, they're just both different and geniuses in their own right, of course. But I really did, um, it was interesting to, I remember we would play different types of music and it was a, it was a funny sibling rivalry. And it's, it's interesting too, to think about it in that light where, yeah, maybe that's not the most typical rivalry or something with uh, regards to music, um, musical taste at such a young age, but I was really drawn to that. But then very quickly, I mean, I got into, through my brother, I got into like the Moody Blues. So like from Beethoven to like listening to MP3s, which was really weird at the time because nobody really knew what an MP3 was, but a neighbor that knew what mp3s were <laughs> so he was like download the stuff for us and uh, train in november rain by guns and roses and comfortably numb and my brother played a lot of guitar like obsessively like just played a lot of guitar and our rooms were right next to each other so a lot of his musical taste then started to seep into mine obviously as the younger brother you look up to your older brother and uh you know so my musical what i was drawn to was it was kind of all over the map it was sort of this chaotic pinball machine of, of tastes hitting my brain which i think I'd like to think I bring to not only the Lumineers when I write the music, but also with my solo stuff. And it's sort of like coming from that background, um, I think it's helped me greatly. Yeah, and, and I think something that I've, you know, I mean, observed, which is really beautiful. And obviously I really wanna talk about 
um, the the new album, you know, uh, is a calmness, right? And kind of that uh, that you know, kind of having that foundation for music uh, that you did as a child. Uh, I mean, I think has spawned to the the way to where we are now with this new album. It's just and kind of you're tying in with you know calm as well, right? I'm kind of bringing these calm uh, these songs to that platform. So, I mean, tell me kind of. I mean, you, you kind of speak so much through your music. Uh, could, like, how do you connect uh, when you're when you sit down at the piano? With, you know, and kind of where where do you go to? I think for me, with when I sit down at the piano, it's I feel like the luckiest person in the universe. I feel like there was a quote I remember about ten years ago, maybe even longer. I went to a museum. It was like the it was a museum of music in Vienna, Austria, and there was a composer in there and he said something to the effect of like, you know, he could have all the riches and all the gold in the world, or he could like sit down at the piano. And when he said that, when he sat down at the piano, it was as if he already had all that stuff and he didn't need anything else. And I feel really lucky that I have a hobby that turned into my career. And then my career and my hobbies and the thing that like probably greatly stresses me out but this passion and quite literally escape um but i think when i sit down at the piano it's i look at the shapes too i look at a lot of shapes that my hands make it's not just of course it needs to sound good but if i get bored i'll just make different shapes different clusters i mean and i'm talking about physical physicality of the shapes um and i like to try different things so if i feel like i'm in a creative rut and I'm like, well, if you if you keep making the same shapes, you know, it's kind of like the definition of insanity. If you keep doing the same thing and expecting different results, then what what do you expect? So, uh, when I sit down at the piano, I like to make different shapes. I like to obviously listen, and I have a, a weird inability that when I do play music, sometimes I don't have a great idea of what I'm doing. I have it like, oh, I like this, but I constantly record myself with the voice memo on the iPhone, and when I listen back, then it becomes clear. Oh, wow. Is a really cool idea or like oh wow that's a really crummy idea you just you had caffeine in your system you thought it was good but it actually wasn't um i think another thing that has really inspired me when playing is that there was that avant-garde composer uh john cage and he talked about this idea of positive void versus negative space and um i just love that i think with my piano music in general whether it is for luminaires or my solo stuff on this album piano piano I think there's a lot of space in between the notes, a lot of space at, at times in between the chords. And, you know, that quote, the idea of positive space versus negative or positive void versus negative space, it's a little bit of semantics, but I just love the, the intention, the intention behind that idea that it's not just circumstantially negative space. You're actually saying, no, I want this to be a positive void. You're intentionally, you know, leaving these giant gaps at times. And I think that it's quite easy to get loud, arguably with any genre of music, whether you're Slipknot or whether you're John Cage, to get loud and chaotic is a is a move, you know, but to get silent and to actually make the listener go, like I think silence almost wakes people more up than a loud now than the loud noise might do, arguably. So I try to I try to incorporate all these ideas um, subconsciously. I think if you think too much about what you're doing at the time. You're probably right worse but i think subconsciously a lot of the stuff i'm talking about uh seeps into my music without me being uh, always aware of it yeah and uh, and so uh, so i got to listen to the album between last night and and uh this morning and and first of all i, I love it it's i mean it again oh, it's, it's just a beautiful work of art um and i want to know kind of where the idea came from you know to to kind of you know, to, to take this exploration yourself and um, and kind of go down this path with Piano Piano. So it's been a long time coming. I mean, some of the song ideas are over 10 years old. I think there's one called Nearsighted. I think it's yeah. track five. That, that guitar I recorded, so I studied abroad in London. I was 21 at the time and I'm 34 now. So we're talking 13, 14 years ago. I, that song has probably got to be the oldest one. That guitar, like the stem, that actual guitar take, I recorded, I came home from a bar, was in my dorm room, and I recorded the guitar with my old crummy laptop, just using like the small hole. And I kept that. And, you know, the engineer, David Barron, was like, do you have the stems to this? It just sounds really like, 
I think he was like a polite way of saying it sounds really bad. And I was like, no, I don't. This is like, we just need to use this. Trust me. It's, there's something cool about this. So, you know, going 12, 13 years back and everything in between that, I've always been writing this instrumental music. Um, writing with the Lumineers, me and Wes, the singer, write all the music together. Um, I write so much and I write so many different types of ideas that they don't always work with the Lumineers. So, for example, uh, there's two songs that got released as Lumineer songs called April and patience. Now those are two instrumental piano songs. And I think that was a way that like that, not so much leaving breadcrumbs or something, but just a way that I'm writing these songs. And then eventually it seemed to make sense for uh, the Lumineers works of, or, you know, the Lumineers works. And um, I think for the better part of a decade, I've wanted to record this album. I've really wanted to get all these ideas, that, all the music I hear in my head and get them out, you know, on, onto wax, so to speak. And as fate would have it, you know, we were on tour with the Lumineers. We had a big, massive world tour, about an 18 month, two year world tour planned. Um, the pandemic started and I, I came home in about middle of March. And my wife, Francesca was like, you know, that album that you were gonna record in a year or two from now, you should do it now. And I was like, no, I don't want to do it now because I got to do it in my home. And then I was calling studios before I really understood how bad the pandemic was. And I realized how dangerous that would be. And then, because I have three pianos here, I have two uprights and a grand. And I thought, man, what a, what an undertaking this is going to be. What a nightmare. I'm going to have to do everything myself. I don't know how to record a piano well. Um, we have a two-year-old son in the house. We have a dog that barks when I play the piano. And there was literally a house to my right. They're still building it. And we're in November. And I started recording this album in April. I'm not even joking. They literally started building a house right next door. So I was like, man, everything is going against me in this album. And uh, in about three months time, I made it work. Recorded it all here. Was FaceTiming with my engineer, David Barron, who's fantastic. He's worked with, he worked with me on this. Um, he's in New York State in his studio. And we were FaceTiming and using some really cool, like, uh, software where we can communicate almost in real time, like lossless connection. And uh, at times he was like, man, what is that rumbling? Or, you know, I was like, oh, it's a truck dropping off cement or it's a lumber. You know, he was like, man, it sounds like a house is being built. I was like, yeah, it literally is. So it was, when I think back to it, I almost can't think back to it. It was so crazy and so much work and so stressful at times, but got it done. There's somehow. something that's so calm. There's so much noise, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, you know, when my son Tommaso would take his nap in the middle of the day for hopefully like two hours, sometimes it was shorter, sometimes it was longer, I'd record then or around 8 p.m. when he went to bed, I'd have to record at night after a long day of tinkering and doing stuff on the music. So, and then recording with cellists in New York State and we recorded with a 40 person orchestra in macedonia you know we did this like yeah yeah, the fames orchestra this 40 person macedonian orchestra was so cool and i we did like a facetime essentially i could see them doing it and then you'd say i'll play it more legato or do this or that and yeah the whole thing was you know 20 years ago I i would not have been able to do it so i felt thankful for technology that um for arguably such an acoustic sounding record and such a you know, organic sounding record. It was, it relied heavily on the technology. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when you're going into this, uh, and this might be a weird question, but like when you're doing something that's just instrumental and, uh, and doesn't have any lyrics, like let's take the song Maggie, for instance, right? That's about uh, Francesca's dog who, you know, passed away. Uh, I mean, like, how do you tell, you know, the story that you want to tell without, without words when you're kind of putting it to music? What does that look like for you? I think for me, it's a little bit reverse engineering. I think that the song gets written and I just worry about the song. And then the song title gets changed nine times out of 10 because a lot of the times the song titles are really scientific for lack of a better description because I write so much, I need to try to remember the idea. So Maggie was always called Sufjan Stevens. And I don't know why I called it that. I just, it reminded me of kind of of one of his songs kind of and like but it doesn't sound like anything like it and it just was like oh Sufjan Stevens reminded me of that and so I can remember that Tokyo was originally called a major classical and 
so I think when the song was finished, it just felt with Maggie, for example, um, we were mixing it and the day that we were mixing it, the final, the, the final day we were putting the finishing touches on it. Um, my wife was upstairs and texted me and she said, you know, our, my dog Maggie just passed away. And immediately I thought, wow, what a perfect, you know, thankfully her dog's name had a beautiful name and it wasn't like, I don't know, <laughs> some, some weird dog name that I would like, couldn't use because it wouldn't sound butch, pretty, but just butch yeah yeah it's <laughs> so, like yeah. Ah, i love your dog yeah. but i'm not going to name it butch um <laughs> and i think too like the name the song titles can be really difficult ironically or believe it or not because a lot of the song titles are sometimes one you know one word where they might be as many as five or six but it's really important because there's no words because there's really nothing else to base off of the song title I spend a lot of time on because it needs to be perfect. It, it can't just be good. It, like for me, it really needs to be perfect. And some people might think, well, your, your song titles are this or that. But for me, like they are, they, they feel perfect in that when you hear the name Maggie, you know, maybe you think, Oh, who is she? Maybe you read about a dog and then it changes it for better, for worse. And, you know, I, I just love that idea of, starting out with a little morsel, a little crumb, and hopefully giving the listener, uh, oh, wow, there's like, there is some three dimensionality to this, even though there's no words. Yeah, and uh, with Patience, you you wrote that one for the Lumineers, but you just uh, decided to put it on this album solo. So can, tell me tell me kind of about that process. Yeah, so that Patience just came out as the Lumineers on album two, Cleopatra. And that was something where I always had that idea and there was a song called My Eyes, which was the last song on Cleopatra, and it was in B major. And then I realized the song Patience was in B, actually the pa Patience was in C major. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll drop it down to B. It might be a really cool way to like, you know, say goodbye to the album. And we tried it in the studio and it just felt perfectly. And me, Wes, and uh, the producer, Simon Felice, we all really loved the idea of ending the Lumineers album with an instrumental song. And I think we thought it was a kind of a cool risk or a bold move because here we are coming off the heels of album one with a song like Hohe that can cast a shadow on your, like it's like casting a shadow on your own body, like some weird reverse like shadow effect or something where, um, you know, we had, we felt like we had to climb out of that shadow, so to speak, of Hohe and the massive success that we saw overnight, even though we had been working for the better part of a decade, me and Wes on music. Um, so to end the, the sophomore, the follow al follow up album with an instrumental, we thought this is probably going to surprise people. This is going to really like do something. And then um, on album three that we called three, um, same thing where there was an old song I had and it was originally written for my son, Tommaso. We ended up calling it April, which is the birthday of, which is the month of his birthday. It's also the month of my my brother's birthday. So that April is also the month in which we released our first and second Lumineers albums. So April is just like a really important month for me in general. And uh, yeah, again, that felt really, it, it didn't feel gimmicky. You know, it wasn't like, oh, let's put another instrumental song. It just was like, oh, this, this feels like good music. And that set up the last song on the album called Salt and Sea that we just thought that was a really good, you know, sort of set the dinner table before you eat or something. Yeah. Um, and so um, you talked a little bit about um, kind of how you, you've been doing a distance, but like, tell me a little bit about how you got set up with uh, David Barron and, um, and kind of what he brought to this al album. So David Barron, I mean, I couldn't have made it without him. I can't speak highly enough. Basically on album two, on the Lumineers album two called Cleopatra, we were in uh, Rhinebeck at the studio called The Clubhouse. We were making the album and in the band, I've always been the guy to like, I feel like that can provide the weird sounds and like, you know, the little salt and pepper sounds that sometimes a song needs. And the producer, Simon Fleece was like, well, there's this guy named David Barron. He's really, really talented at doing that type of stuff. We should bring him in. And I was like, whatever, let's, let's check him out. And uh, he just came in and just, his musicianship is just so world-class that he didn't, he just kind of came in and like, he did some stuff on some keyboards and synthesizers. It was almost like a ghost came in and then he left and then he would do the most subtle stuff to some of these songs. And it just would make the song like, you know, when someone does something to a song and you say, 
I can no longer imagine it without that anymore. That's the best thing that anyone could ever do for any piece of art for that matter, whether it's a scene in a film or, or a song like we're talking about. So slowly but surely we became great friends. And then when I made this, when I decided to make this record, you know, I called him and I said, I really want to just do this with you. I want to keep it really small. Um, he'd help me FaceTime and set up the mics and then I'd record. I would Dropbox him or we transfer him the session. He would check it, make sure the phase was like, he'd do all the deep science and stuff. And uh, it was a trip. And then he would add some like low uh, mo deep sub bass synthesizer stuff or um, working with this Macedonian orchestra, the Fames Orchestra, he introduced me to them. And I don't know much about sheet music. So to get my music um, from the computer onto sheet music so that an orchestra like the Fames Orchestra can actually read and perform, um, he's trained in that field. So that was a huge help for me personally, that he could take my music and essentially um, put it to sheet music, you know, make it proper and help me with the charts. So I can't speak highly enough of David. This album would have been uh, terrible without his expertise. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, so tell me a little bit about Firewood and its impact on, uh, you know, on this album and kind of your history with, uh, with this piano. So this album, um, well, this piano rather, Firewood is a nickname for my favorite piano in the entire world. Um, I have a piano tuner in Denver. And I asked him, I said, you know, Michael, what do you think of this piano? I, this is like my favorite piano. And, uh, you know, what do you think of it? And he said, partner, it's firewood. And he basically, you know, he referred to it as like, it's as good, it's only good to burn essentially to keep you warm. Um, and that honestly only made me like it more, the fact that he called it firewood and the fact that it has that tendency to just sound really strange. And um, it makes these random sounds when you push the keys. And I love that about it. It can be really frustrating at times too, of course, but for the most part, about 85% of the time, I'm really, really happy with Firewood's performance. Um, and I think it gives me, in my head, it gives me a leg up because there's so many piano albums out there. There's so many piano records that have been made. There's so many pianos in existence, but this one, I'm telling you, I've never heard a piano sound like this in my entire life. And there's something special about it. I think the specialness about it, um, I think for a while I thought it was sort of this mythological like wow it's so special it it's special but it's not so mysterious so the bridge of the piano is cracked <laughs> um so it's kind of broken which even makes me like it even more so the bridge of the piano like a guitar bridge like a guitar has a bridge a, a piano has a bridge also the pr the bridge of this piano is cracked and it was made by a company called Krakauer. They were in uh, New York City and they used to make pianos. They no longer do. I looked at the serial number and this piano is from 1955. So the strings have never been changed. So the strings even are over 50 years old. So, you know, it's just, it's all these things have kind of created the myth, the ethos and the, you know, yeah, the, the ethos or the myth of a, a firewood. And, Originally, I thought I was going to record the entire album of Piano Piano just on Firewood. But then I realized I was going to sort of shoot myself in the foot or do myself and do these songs, most importantly, a disservice. For example, there's a song on the album called Maggie that I think categorically would not have worked as well on Firewood. Um, on the flip side of that, there's a song called Tokyo that, that's Firewood. And it categorically would not have worked as well just on a big, beautiful grand piano. So a lot of the, once the songs were written, um, it was sort of a philosophical then debate in my own head of should I use firewood or should I use the grand piano? And then even while they were being written, um, the instrument that I was writing them on would dictate, you know, the musical notes I would choose. Like, for example, there's a song called Chili. There's a song called Maggie. There's a song called An Air That Kills. Those are all on the grand piano. And I feel like the way I wrote them are meant to be performed on a grand piano and not specifically on firewood. Again, on the flip side of that, songs like Tokyo, Arrival, um, Possessed, they were quite literally written on and for firewood. So there was a lot of obsessing and a lot of... Uh, philosophical debates and 
agony uh, of me going back and forth of what instrument to use for, it seems like a simple decision, but it, it wasn't. Yeah, and you've, and you've wrote some of, you know, your biggest Lumineers songs, you know, on Firewood as well, right? So, I mean, is it, do you have that same sort of battle when it comes to those songs? You know, what, what is the right platform for this? What do I want to bring into uh, the song? That's, yeah, that, that battle, quote unquote, feels easier for some reason. It feels more like, because you have the singer and you have, it, it just gets quickly, um, I think it's quicker to understand once the singer starts to sing, you're like, oh, this is too, you know, firewood's not going to work. It's too, too thin. Let's use a grand piano. Um, and then sometimes you're like, well, I don't want it to sound too perfect or too pearly white. So let's use firewood, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so tell me about kind of the partnership when it came to Spitfire Audio and being able to bring, uh, you know, firewood to the masses, I guess. So I reached out to them and I said, I know you guys are probably not interested in this, but there's a song called Donna that was written on Firewood completely. And, you know, you had mentioned before uh, the song Ophelia, which has become one of our biggest songs as Balloonineers. The bones of that song I started writing over 12 years ago in my house in Ramsey, New Jersey on Firewood, which is crazy. It's really crazy that, um, you know, a song can, can start that long ago and then the fruition it was like sometimes a decade later, but that's kind of neither here nor there. But um, Spitfire, I reached out to them and I said, hey, listen, I got this sort of really janky, strange sounding piano. And I already knew that they had tons of pianos in their sample library. So I was really doubtful that I didn't even get a response. Also, I had no way to contact them. So I contacted customer support and I sent an email and I said, my name is Jeremiah. I know this is customer support, but can you please like ask someone like the higher up? I have a really cool uh, idea for a piano. Here's my email. Didn't hear anything back. And then I got an email, I think from this guy named Stanley. And it was sort of like, yeah, like what's up? You know, what, uh, what are you thinking? And I said, well, check this out. There's a song called Donna. It's a really, like that song, Donna, the mix of that song is really strange. Like it's almost unrecognizable. To be to recognize as a piano it's a really strange piano timbre i sent him that and i think that's i think that's all it took for them to realize wow firewood is really something special and it actually just came out last week they sent me a couple of emails and said the response has been amazing people have really loved it people really love it for the right reasons too they're saying there's so much dynamic there's so much control um and the thing i love about it is it has, it has these three sounds that i really love it has uh, the normal grand piano, the normal upright piano sound, which is kind of akin to like a bar saloon, like, I don't know, dirtbag kind of sounding upright piano. And then the, the real firewood in my mind is when it's felted. And when I say it's felted, I was going to try to show you this, but my, my Wi-Fi doesn't work over there so hot. Um, obviously, when you hit the key, the hammer hits the string. So in between the hammer and the, uh, the string, me and my father-in-law, Gianni, we went to a uh, Joanne Fabrics here in Denver. And I think we spent like $2 and 17 cents and bought some acrylic felt. And we just taped the felt in between the string and the, the key, the hammer. And it gives it this really, really soft sort of pure, beautiful sound. And uh, I, yeah, I just, I, I really love that sound a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, and so um, I want to uh, I want to ask you. Uh, well, let's let's transition to a little bit of Lumineers uh, stuff, sure. right? Um, so you put out three uh, last year, your your third album, and I mean your your approach to this was really unique and, and awesome, right? I mean, so so some bands have done the you know okay, we'll we'll put out we'll make a video for each song, you know, sort of thing, and and that really helps promote it. But the way that the you know your, your video is all tied together into you know ultimately like a short film um, was I mean it was so cool, and uh, you know you got the the kid from Ozark and you know, you know too, <laughs> yeah he's is Charlie's awesome. amazing Charlie's a, he's a legend yeah um, yeah. So, Basically once, so me and Wes write all the music together, Wes writes 99% of the lyrics. And uh, I, like when I say 99%, he writes all the lyrics, but I'll send him like, I sent him, for example, a lyric, you hate the name Donna, or in the song, slow it down. I think I literally said the word slow. And then he like, you know, runs with it. So he writes all the lyrics, but um, 
we me and him write all the music together and we finished the album three and it was done and then i think wes and his friend nick bell they started like tinkering with the idea of oh wow maybe there's characters that are developing within these songs like charlie tahan's character uh junior sparks and there was a song already called jimmy sparks and then it's like well maybe jimmy and this is again it was, it was wes and nick bell sort of like thinking about this and then they presented it to uh, this director named Kevin Phillips. Now, Kevin Phillips did a movie called Super Dark Times. It's on Netflix, I believe. And I watched it. I loved it. Wes told me to watch it. He loved it also, of course. And then we reached out to Kevin Phillips to say, would you be interested to take every music video and turn it into a film? But also every video needs to stand on its own. And you have like three weeks to do it. <laughs> um, he said yes, probably reluctantly, but he was really excited. And I think I asked him when we were shooting, we were in Portland, Oregon, and I said, we were shooting some of the movie out there. And I said, can I ask you like, what was the moment that you thought this would be a good idea? Because I think we asked him and then he's like, well, I gotta listen to the album. I need to feel connected. And he said, it was the first song, Donna. He said he heard the piano and he just heard that song and was just like, wow, okay, I'm doing it. Like there's something different about this album, something different about this record. So that's kind of how it came together. I mean, it all sounds pretty easy when I when I summarize it like that, but it was a lot of people tinkering. It was a lot of people thinking about stuff and it really all came together in, a, in such a beautiful way. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely did. And and being able to, you know, kind of bring that to the live show. I know you've done some shows where um, you'll play kind of the album sequentially, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those albums that kind of, you know, it, ha it has that ability to be, be done. Like, so what has that experience been like for you when, you when you've been able to do that? I think for us, it really showed us that um, our fans are with us. I think people are with us. I think, I guess what I mean by that is if you believe it to be good inside, it might sound cheesy, but if you really do believe it to be good, if you really feel like, if you know that you're doing your music and art in the most sincere almost selfish endeavor where you're like, I want to get high off my own music. I think this is so cool. This is what I want from other bands. Um, I think your fans and I think people that slowly like your music, uh, they stay with you and they follow you. And I think with, with the album three, the ability, I think that we play almost every song off the album three, which is kind of weird for a band like us because a lot of our biggest songs were previously off of albums one and two. Songs like Ho Hey, Cleopatra, Sleep on the Floor, things like that. So to have a third album out that in our minds, it was our best album to date. It felt like the most, like in some way we almost felt like this sounds like the most like us in some weird way. And I think people had pegged us in a certain way based on album one that we were sort of these like, come on y'all, like we're just this acoustic strumming band. I, I don't know, like the, there was this thing that there was like this, this rock or the shadow that we had to climb out of or something. And not to say that we made three drastically different than the previous two albums because we were like rebelling against that. It just it just naturally came about like that. We were just writing and whatever we wrote, we'd liked a lot. And normally in the past with albums one and two, I feel like we'd spend a lot of time like talking about the songs and thinking about the songs. And album three, it was just more like, oh, this feels good. Let's just record it. It's done. It's great. So it was really fun in that regard too, to make that album really fun. And, you know, and obviously there's a streamline, you've talked about it before with uh, addiction and uh, everything you, I mean, it's very, I think, personal album for you uh, as well, right? With losing your brother yeah. and, um, and you've been, you know, uh, sober now for over five years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's a really deeply personal record um, for me and the singer Wes in, in different ways. I mean, I can speak only on my for my on my on my behalf, but uh, about 20 years ago, I lost my older brother Joshua to a heroin drug overdose. He was 19 at the time, and I was about 14, just starting high school. So, you know, I pray it's the the worst thing that ever happens to me. Um, and then I just celebrated five years of sobriety myself. Um, so this album about talking about sort of the cycle of addiction and how it gets passed down from generation to generation and things like that uh, really struck a chord with me, of course. And I think that 
I think at times we were worried that it was going to feel too personal or too raw or too people might just say it's too dark I don't get it it's too dark why you know why are you talking about drugs and addiction and stuff like that and I think the reality was people really opened up you know we do me and West do a lot of meet and greets and meet people that are fans of the band and they come up to us sometimes and say like you know that album really struck a chord with me like I lost my mom to this or I lost this or that and um yeah so it was a really special profound album to work on I think that I don't know. Well, I know for a fact there won't be another album like that in our in our career. They'll 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 all be different. They'll always be different, but that one was very particular and uh, specific. So, yeah. And and how have you seen your music uh, change? Like, I mean, it, kind of tying into your your sobriety um, yourself. Like, have you seen any differences when you're kind of making music? Yeah, a lot. Uh, so when I first got sober, um, people told me, you're going to be more creative. You're going to like music even more. And I thought, what a what a load of shit. That's, that's honestly what I thought. I thought, um, I'm not going to feel more connected to music. I'm going to feel less connected. I'm going to feel less creative. Because I think I was worried about, you know, maybe taking, removing alcohol, or removing drugs or whatever, like, would take away the creativity, would take away the passion for music or something. And it was just such a, such a stupid, naive, ignorant, childish thing to think because after about a year and a half, two years, I really started to realize like, wow, I'm way more connected to my music now than I ever have been. I'm way more connected to even performing. Performing that was really tough because the first 50 shows or so to go out in front of 10,000 people completely sober with nothing, was really terrifying. And I think I was so used to like, you know, having a few drinks or drinking during the show that I would be able to just be more loosey goosey and and just like, but to go out there and just hear all the screaming fans and see all those screaming fans and be completely sober. And, you know, the best and the worst part of being sober all the time is that you're, is you're more lucid. <laughs> so obviously that's good. But then like after a long, hard day, you're still lucid and you're still living inside your own head. And sometimes the hardest thing about, uh, you know, it's like sometimes the hardest thing about, this might sound too dramatic, but about being alive is that you wake up with the same person every morning, <laughs> you know, yourself, you wake up in the same head every morning and you're like, oh, all right, it's another day with the same person. Here we go. Same. Uh, but all in all, it's been so much better. My relationship with my wife, Francesca, has improved so much. My, you know, I'm a father of a two and a half year old son, Tommaso. Uh, my relationship with my bandmates is better with myself. It's better with my parents. I feel like I've never been more creative and it's just been flowing out of me. So it's been, it's been really positive. Yeah. Um, so a couple of quick questions as we kind of start to, to wind down a little bit. Like what would, I mean, uh, Lumineers uh, and your, yourself, of course, have obviously seen a great amount of success. What would you say was one of the kind of, um, you know, more pivotal points in uh, in this journey with uh, with the band? Like, what is one of the things that really stands out of like, okay, yeah, this is this is something really special that you've been able. To I support. think for me, one of the, one of the coolest things that we ever got to experience, and we we're so lucky, so lucky, was to open up for U two um, at their stadium tour in the United States for their Joshua Tree reunion. It was the 30th anniversary of a uh, Joshua Tree album. You know, it's like this pinnacle, it's like one of the top 10 albums ever made. I mean, not just from U2, it's like, we're talking ever. It's just, it's one of those albums, right? And we got to open up for them in stadiums. So now we're talking 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people that are all there to see U2. They're not coming to see the Lumineers. Maybe some came to see the Lumineers, but let's be honest, like 99% of those people are going to see U2 and Bono, excuse me. So um, it was really nerve wracking, but it was one of the most special, coolest experience of our entire lives in our careers, in our personal lives, in our, it just was such a trip. And then to watch them. So you'd finish your show and then you got to see one of the biggest bands in the world every night front row perform one of the biggest albums ever made yeah. in the history of music. It just was, yeah, I just got goosebumps. Like, it just was so cool. It really was, you know, it was about 12 shows too. So it wasn't really short. It was so, uh, it's really special. 
Did you have any moments with Bono that they kind of stood out? <laughs> we got to meet them. It was very brief, but it was, uh... actually I had one moment with him. It was quite funny and it was kind of accidental. Um, I, <laughs> so it was the last show. It was in uh, New York city. It was actually in New Jersey, technically at the giant stadium. I forget the name of the, the venue. It's a stadium. It's the giant with the New York giants play. And, uh, we did two nights there. I mean, you two did two nights there, but we opened up for them both nights. And then there was an after party in New York City and, you know, you two's after party, like, yeah, it sounds cool. Let's do that. So I went to it and it was just all very surreal. There's just so many famous people around and we're just sort of like hanging out with ourselves and, you know, trying to stay out of the way of these people. And at the end of the night, I wanted to say bye to Bono it was such a cool tour and i wanted to not be that guy that's like yo let me get an autograph or a photo i just really wanted to say bye and thanks so he was dancing with his wife you know they're on the dance floor he's dancing with his wife and i went i went up to him just to try to give him like a handshake but i think he thought i was trying to like dance so he just like took me and like it was really quick i mean it happened for like two and a half seconds and i was like the music was so loud and i'm probably screaming like thank you so much you know the tour was awesome like hopefully we can do it again and then you know, he said, ah, oh, we love you. It was great. And then that was it. And it just was like, you know, walking back to the hotel, you're like, okay, that just happened. Sick. That'll never happen again. And is this real life kind of thing? And then, but then you realize everybody's just, you know, we're all just people. They're all just people. And it's just, they live extraordinary lives. But um, yeah, that was such a special memory. Just that whole, that whole experience. And also Adam Clayton, the bassist of a, uh, you okay. two. Um, I looked up to him a lot, not only as a musician, but also his work that he's done um, with rehabilitation, with drugs and alcohol. He's been sober for many years. I think even 20, 25, 30 years now he's been sober. So that was inspiration for me to be like, well, here's a guy in one of the biggest bands in the world thriving and he's doing it sober. So that gives me hope. And I hope that younger bands, younger generations, younger artists one day you know, maybe look at me and they go, okay, well, it's possible because unless you see somebody else do it, you might just be like, that's, hey, you know, nah, it's not for me. But when you see someone else that you think is cool doing it, you're like, okay, cool. It's possible. Yeah. And taking care of yourself and, you know, and being able yeah. to be there for your kid. Right. You know, I mean, that's all that stuff. Probably an important yeah. part of it too, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, being as you're, you're in Denver now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you, uh, and you, I mean, you've, you lived in Denver for like 10 years or something. Is that right? About a decade. Yeah. I lived here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, uh, I got to experience Red Rocks for the first time last year, uh, seeing Weird Al in the Colorado Symphony. Uh, wow. and, uh, yeah, uh, I, it was more about going to Red Rocks. I, I'm, I'm in the Bay Area. I'm in Napa. Um, my, myself. Ah, cool. Uh, but you know, I uh, I talked to so many bands and just hear about how ma you know magical Red Rocks is. But I want to hear from, you know, kind of from your perspective, you know, as someone you know who lived there and everything, and I've pl probably played at Red Rocks you know a number of times. What 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 does it mean to you? So when I moved to Denver ten years ago, um, we just thought of Red Rocks as like the Madison Square Garden of. Colorado or something it was like the mecca it was the place to to eventually play maybe when we were 50 type of thing like maybe when we're 50 we'll half we're all like half sell it out it'll be awesome or something and um it's just it's crazy to yeah I think we've played it now five or six or seven times and it's just it never gets old it's such a magical beautiful place but when we moved to Denver um my first job was a pretty much my only job, but I was a busboy at a Japanese restaurant called the Sushi Den. And it's this Japanese sushi restaurant. It's amazing food, amazing place. And I was just the busboy there and trying to make ends meet and, you know, trying to make the band take off or whatever. And I cut out a photo of Red Rocks and I like taped it in my room because I heard about this idea of like, if you want to imagine something, just like try to visualize it every day. And if you want money, maybe take photos of money or whatever, but for me, it was Red Rocks, and I looked at it just every morning. There was a subconscious thing. I like put socks on, look at it. Okay, I wouldn't stare at it. You know, I just would look at it every now and then. And eventually, we got the call to. I think the first time we technically played there was we opened up for Cake, 
the band Cake, mm, yep. which was very cool. But then the first time we actually sold it out and headlined, that was like the pinnacle achieve, har, you know, hallmark moment. So that was, um, excuse me, by far the most, uh, that was the special one. Opening for Cake was really cool in its own right, but to be able to do it ourselves and sell it out nonetheless, it was uh, really special. And we actually did it with the Colorado Symphony Orchestra a while ago and it was raining and the Colorado Symphony they were playing and it was just the whole thing was so epic. It was so cool. Yeah. What an amazing experience, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was it was awesome. Yeah. And so uh I guess my last question, Jeremiah, so you're you're in Denver right now. You're working on new Lumineer stuff. Uh following up from three, what can you tell us? What does that look like for you guys? What is the what is the process, you know, um for uh for this next album that you're you're working on? It's a good question. It's something that's TBD, um, yet to be determined, even why TBD, uh, <laughs> which is like a double TBD, I guess. Uh, it's it's in the works. I mean, it's in, in the sense that I'm trying not to give anything away or say anything that is incorrect also. Essentially, I'm back in Denver and we're gonna work on some music and see what happens. I mean, we have a lot of ideas but ideas are just ideas until they're worked on. So this this next month, all of November, up until about Thanksgiving, and then I'm gonna fly back to Italy around, I think literally on Thanksgiving is my flight. Um, I'll probably do an early Thanksgiving with my folks. My parents are out here in Denver and Wes's mom lives out here in Denver. So we have a lot of family out here and stuff, but um, it's it's because of COVID and the pandemic that we're even considering doing this album like we're starting it because we were supposed to be on tour for the next year and a half, two years. So it does feel premature mentally. I mean, this album three just came out in September and for the life of a band, for the life of an album, that's extremely, in my opinion, short or quick soon to be working on new material. So that's been an uphill battle mentally. Physically, we have time. I mean, we have so much time now, too much time, but Mentally, it's an uphill battle, no doubt, like for sure. It's very difficult to wrap your head around, especially also after such a draining personal album like Three was for both of us in so many ways, lyrically, musically, and what it meant for us in our personal lives. So the idea to make a whole LP now feels impossible, but you just got to start it, you know, and it's all about trusting the process too. It's just when, I, when Wes and I get together and we just start to work, and we get the dry erase board out and we start to take notes and it's nothing magical. It's not like you take peyote and you go in the desert and you make an album. It's just like, it's just trusting the very boring process or the, the very fundamental process of waking up, showing up, putting in the time and out comes an album. So that's, it doesn't sound glamorous when you say it like that, but I love it. So. Well, it's, it's great. And yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, your first two albums, you had four years in between. And so there was able to, yeah. you know, he was able to tour behind it, able to support it, you know, the ability to have that time to let it breathe a little bit before moving on to the next, but the world has kind of shifted <laughs> right now and you're you're taking advantage of the time that you got, so that's great. Trying to, yeah, trying to. Do you, I guess one more question, do you see yourself being able to play some shows for, uh, you know, solo for uh, Piano Piano? Does that, I mean, obviously- I do. Not right now, I think, not right now. <laughs> I but, do, I think, so I'll be in Italy, uh, maybe I might try to organize some stuff in Italy. I think they just locked, they went into full blown lockdown. So I think if I were able to play a show, we're talking like playing at like a Starbucks, <laughs> I don't even know, but it would have to probably be at this point, January, February, March, April. I have no idea with this now that flu season's upon us. Um, Cause we haven't experienced COVID-19 with the flu season. I mean, I guess it technically started in December in China, but you know, it got really bad in the rest of the world, February, March, if I'm not mistaken. So now that we're going into full-blown flu season and COVID is still surging, um, it's really hard to say, but I hope to soon. Yeah. Well, Jeremiah, I want to thank you for, for taking the time. This was really a pleasure. And Yeah, and thank you, I, man. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'm loving the new album. I'm glad you were able to, you know, to kind of step aside from the veneers. Not so, not step aside, but you know, be able to do, 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 um, creatively no, do your yeah. own thing at the same time. You know, um, it's it's really really awesome. So, um, look Thank forward so to it coming out. So, um, cool. Yeah.
Well, good uh, good luck with the new album as well, and have a have an awesome rest of your day. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Jeremiah. <laughs> that was the interview with Jeremiah Freitz from the Lumineers and Jens. That takes us to the final segment of the program. What is it? It does, and that is our segment where we talk about all the things happening in music this week. <laughs> That's right. Uh, a couple of good stories. Uh, so Jens, I'll let you start this, uh, start out this time because this is the you know Thanksgiving week, and I want to you know be, show you that you know I'm thankful for the stories that you bring. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're just seeing if I'm paying attention, right? Like, right, right. Because yeah, you know where his phone is with the story on it, right? <laughs> so we got a story about Kiss. Let's kiss. You up know, there. I. Every time I, 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 I present a story about Kiss, I just, the same thing happens to me over and over and over again. It's like, why did I not buy tickets to that last Kiss concert when they were in town? Yeah, you're, you're kicking yourself, huh? Kicking I know. myself for all those shows I didn't see that I could have seen before the pandemic hit. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're, you're like, man, I could have gone to this concert and this concert. Now I can't go to any, but you know. I know, I know, I know. It's so crazy not to get too off topic, but I mean, not too long ago, I mean, a couple of years, but not too long ago, we were having a similar conversation about how we're kicking ourselves for not taking that opportunity to see some major names that have come that are coming to the Bay Area because shortly after the concert, they died. Yes. Prince. Right? Prince. Yes. Right? And yes. it's like, you take this shit for granted. And then, you know, you, you, you say to yourself, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do that again. You know what? Even if the tickets are a little bit too much, you know, more than I want to spend, it's it's priceless. Now you know, it's, for now me, it's not meaningful. Hard. We're gonna go, you know, see whoever we want to see next time they come in town. And boom, the pandemic hits, and now we can't see anyone. Yeah, it doesn't even matter if they're dead. Right. Wow. <laughs> Tell me. Sorry, how I've got a story. You do have a story. Hit us. Yes. So this is about Kiss. So KISS announces a New Year's Eve live stream concert. Oh, there it is. OK, you can watch a live stream on New Year's Eve, right? Yay, at least, at least that's something. At least that's something. And I'm Better really, really dropping. excited that, that bands do this, yes. Um, so they say uh, they've announced um, that they'll host a New Year's Eve live stream event dubbed KISS 2000. 20 goodbye from atlantis dubar do d-u-b-a do do bear du bear the bear okay. the bear uh, whatever on uh, december 31st so i'm hoping that doesn't mean that kiss is going goodbye i'm hoping that means that 2020 is going goodbye i think that's the intent is uh i mean kiss has said that they're going goodbye as well you, but i need some clarification to, yeah, <laughs> it might be a little bit of both, but I don't think they're ready to fully hang up the towel yet, right? So, right, man, they better come back. Um, all right, so the band had this to say quote, after nine months of this pandemic darkness, the world may finally be seeing the light of day. Fingers crossed, I'm adding that they didn't actually say mm. that. Um, on New Year's Eve, Kiss will rock the heavens, shake the earth and blazed the way out of 2020 with the largest and most bombastic celebration in our and anyone else's history. We all need it. We all deserve it. Here's to 2021. They're going big apparently, right? So. I'm already excited. It's not even December yet and I'm stoked. That's awesome. And you know, so these live, live stream shows come around sometimes and it's like, um, you know, I don't know if you're, at all interested in any of them but like sometimes it's like okay that's fun it's not the same as being there in person of course right but it's like if you mm -hmm. really care and appreciate the band you know mm -hmm. it's the closest thing we got right now so like mm -hmm. I, I mean a couple weeks back um andrew mcmahon did his uh, dear jack benefit um and it was live streamed this this year so i was like you know what i'm gonna i'll buy a ticket i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna support the cause and i'm gonna and get to see him, his live show and it's the one time a year he'll play constantine as well um yeah, yeah he he only plays it once a year no matter what's going on and that's worth that. seeing and that was yeah, cool yeah. you know there the foo fighters did a live stream um that 
I had to miss unfortunately because I was out hunting, but um, mm -hmm. I was really, you know, looking forward to seeing that, but I didn't, you know, I may have been able to check it out afterwards, but I didn't. But mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There've been a couple of really, really good live streams, even if it's just one show or even if it's just one song, sorry, not necessarily an entire set. Uh, like even the Rolling Stones, you know, they, they did one of yeah. their, their newer songs um, from last year, whenever it was. And, uh, uh, you know, do you remember that? You remember they, they, were, yeah. they were all in, in, in separate places. They, they somehow put it all together perfectly without any weird lag or interruptions. Uh, drummer guy didn't have his drums. Uh -huh. He was like banging on buckets or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting because that was one of the early ones in, when COVID hit. Right. So. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, uh, also want to say how cool this is. I mean, check this out. So the special show is billed as quote filmed with more than fifty cameras and three hundred and sixty degree views. This show wow. produced by Landmarks Live can be seen globally within. Uh, with ticketing technology and live stream powered by the experience like no other virtual concert before, end quote. That's a lot of that, camera. That's the kind of virtual that's yeah. taking it to the next level, right? It's like you are there. You could turn anyway, you know? I mean, yeah. that's. And that's, that's really fantastic for, for like a Kiss concert, especially because it's so theatrical, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, you got yeah. a story for us? Yes, I do. Um, so this one is about Courtney Love, Jens, and- uh, Oh, how's she doing? Yeah, well, she's hinting at a whole reunion uh, mm. and um, a new solo album. So uh, mm. she, she said, it's early days and I've recorded several new songs whilst I've been in uh, London. Um, so uh, she, she um, let me see here. She, I guess she shared a photo with original members, Patty Schimmel, Melissa uh, Afdumar and Eric uh, Erlinson in the studio. And so in, now in an uh, interview with NME about her life in London and the various projects she's working on, she said there could be more to come. Uh, before I came back, I actually had Melissa and Patty uh, come with our uh, tech to this old world uh, rehearsal studio. Uh, we had a good session, but it takes a bit of time to get back into the rhythm of it all. It's something I'd love to do. And I've been uh, taking guitar lessons over Zoom while in lockdown. And, uh, and I'm writing again, so we'll see. Um, so she's gonna be bringing out some new stuff. And um, nice, nice. No timeline, no little. Nope, uh, no, nope, not that I can see. So, um, all right. But she, but she did move to London to reignite the kind of relationship that you need to have with the guitar to write good guitar songs, apparently. Uh, and she's working on a uh -huh. book and a record. Um, and. Uh, I remember, so her drummer, Patty Schimmel, uh, I've actually interviewed um, at Warp Tour. She was in Juliet Lewis's band. Um, so mm -hmm. the, first, the first time I interviewed Juliet uh, years ago, like 2003, um, was with Patty Schimmel uh, as well. And, uh, and so wow. she, she was pretty cool. Small world. Yep, you know. Uh, we, we saw Juliet together too. Uh, not way back Good. in 2003, but that was more recently. Like uh, last year, right? Um, Berkeley or someplace. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, she's fucking awesome. Yeah. It was sold out, but I was able to uh, get you in and get you a ticket. You, I remember you rolled up like right at the perfect time. Like uh, mm -hmm. they had the list out, you know, because I was, I was trying to get you on the list, but then it, it just worked out perfectly. With it, it was a total synchronicity. I was just like meant to happen. I think some crap happened at work or whatever, and I couldn't get off early enough. I don't remember, but it was some dumb drama, but it all worked out at the end. It did. It did. So. Yeah. You got one more story for us, Jens? Yes, 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 yes. I do have one more story. It's about ACDC. Another fantastic band yes. that also haven't seen and uh, <laughs> have been in the Bay Area several times. And for whatever reason, I'm, I don't know, too cheap or don't want to take a day off because I'm cheap. Uh, and regret that I haven't done it. But their album. Power Up. Power Up has shot to number one and is the fastest selling album of 2020 so far. Wow. Have uh, you listened to this? I, so I listened to half of it. Um, I listened to part of it and then I just like, so I, I don't know, I got bored. Uh, with uh -huh. it. Like it's, it's a good rock album, but it's not classic ACDC and you know, yeah. so I don't know if I need to give it more of a chance or what, but I'm just uh -huh. like, mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling it upon the first listen. So yeah, yeah. 
but I, I was excited when it came out to give it a shot. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, new ACDC. I want to hear some of what's going on. But and it just seemed like loud rock music that you know yeah. didn't have the ACDC charm that you know. Right. The- yeah. It's like you're 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 you know you're you're excited about this album. You know it's coming up. You can't wait for it to be released. But you have these expectations like it's going to be along the same lines as Thunderstruck or Hell's Bells or whatever, right? Yeah. And it's just like okay. no. No, I knew it wasn't going to be any back in black, but yeah, I th- you know, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll go back and give it a listen, the whole thing a listen, because I, I was, you know, pretty excited about new music, but it just didn't jive with me the first time. Yeah, yeah, I'll give it, I'll give it a listen um, today, and 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 I'll get back to you. So I'll, I'll let you know if I got if I got farther through than half the album. <laughs> fair yeah so, it's, like, so it's I, wasn't, doing... I wasn't able to flip over the vinyl man i got to the one side but just side a you're, you got stuck with huh yeah yeah like the tape i you know i couldn't take it out and flip around and I see what you're doing again. yeah so um yeah so anyway quote they say a uh, big shout out to all our fans you are always and have our guiding inspiration what a big shout out to all our fans you are and always have been our guiding inspiration thank you i'm still a bit intoxicated from our party last night yeah anyway plus i'm still drinking uh so that's fantastic you know it's always great when 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 a band gets a uh, you know big shout out to all the fans because hey it's the fans that uh are providing their income right and it's the fans that are basically their employers yeah so to speak. So um ACDC you know, like their power up that is shot number one. I keep on forgetting they're from Australia. Why do I keep on forgetting that? I don't know. Why do you I forget? Yeah. I don't know. I, I forget a lot of things. But anyway, so 18th, that's this is our 18th record. Wow. They put out a couple. Huh? It's that's it, it's, it's not sold sixty two thousand copies. When you think about, yes, 18, well, when you think about how long they've been around, you know, and you'd break down how, how many, like that's one every, yeah. I don't know, four years maybe or that's something. That's true. Something like yeah, that's, that. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So, well, if you think about it that way, it's not that much, you know. Some bands yeah, that's true. Right, but I mean, it's, you, you know, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And so, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. You know, many people are digging it though, so that's good. Yeah, but, uh, I you know what? If I was in a band, and uh, you know, uh, part of me, if I ever had the you know, if I had a life where I was in a band, basically is what I'm saying. Um, I think the more albums that you know we would write, the more anxious I'd be get be getting because that's just more shit to remember. Yeah, like, I more know. lyrics to remember, more chords to remember, or whatever. It's like, oh my god, I forget this shit. I'm gonna screw up on stage. You have to relearn it when you go on, <laughs> you know, on tour and stuff. Because- <laughs> Big, right, right. Those cobwebs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so, just kind of to wrap it up, uh, I want to give everyone a visual here of um, all the members of ACDC uh, uh, on a on a on a track, right? Like this is a, an Olympic event. They're going around the track. They're like doing the, you know, I don't know. What are what are the different Olympic events on a, on a track? Like the thousand meter or the five hundred k dash? Yeah, whatever. not sure. Five hundred k dash. Yeah, five hundred <laughs> kilometer dash. What, what am I even talking about? Yes. Yeah. Five hundred centimeter dash. Like I don't know. Sure, yeah. So you, anyway, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and and there's only one. There's only one person ahead of you, right? There's only one person ahead of, ahead of you, and you've gotta you've gotta pass them to hit the number one album of the year. Sure. And that one fucking person is none other than Kylie Minogue. Oh gosh, really? Kylie Mel, she's she sold fifty five thousand of her new album Disco. And how many did ACDC sell? Uh, just over uh, a little bit more than that, uh, sixty two thousand. Okay, yeah, albums aren't they, selling what they used to, you know. <laughs> like, because, I don't exactly. I don't, those seem like such low numbers. I mean, I would think like that's the day of the release or something, know, you know. I, I don't know. <laughs> like. That's that's an arena full of people or something, else. and you know, it's not right. a in the stadium, but it's like you can get all those people together in one location, you know. And, uh, and who yeah. buys albums these days? I don't remember the last time I bought an album. I think it was like at Target uh, fifteen years ago, and it was maybe the uh axel rose and all those guys oh my god i'm so wasted guns, right now um, guns and roses, guns and roses or... greatest hits or something uh-huh. whatever that album was called yeah 
Yeah. You know, and it's all, I just pay for Apple Music. I yeah. just stream the stuff. And Listen to whatever you want, when you want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, it's so weird, dude. Sorry, I'm taking a lot like, so much airtime here, but I just got to get this off my chest, dude. Yeah, get it off. Like, I used to be against streaming. Like, I used to be yeah. not out of principle or anything, um, uh, but just out of the, the, how important it is that you can hold your music in your hand. Like you need to have the CD or whatever in your hand. Like that's, that's it. Even if there's only one song on it, you like, you have to own it. Right. But now I'm like, God, it's just, I've got all this plastic all over the place. Oh, um, and I just have to keep on spending more and more money on more plastic. Uh -huh. Streaming makes so much more sense. So I just give up. Well, I just, I mean, yeah, the last time I really bought albums or CDs consistently uh, was um, probably when I was doing the, the show before, you know, before we started back back up, back when I used to do it as a TV show. I don't know. It's been a while, right? But when I was interviewing bands before, I'd, I'd buy their album uh, or get a press copy of it or whatever and yeah. then get them, get them to sign it. So I have, you know, a couple hundred signed CDs by bands, you know, in boxes. And uh, there you yeah, go. I that, I mean, that's that. fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that, that there you have a specific objective. You need something for a signature. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so I got that. But yes, uh, yeah, right. I got one more story. Uh, yes, and, hit us. Oh. And, uh, and of course, it has to do with Dave Grohl. Uh, oh, you do not disappoint, my friend. Yeah, so this is just a follow up, really. Uh, we talked last week about his drum battle with Nandy Bushel. Uh, you know, and so he. This is kind of his reflecting on, you know, his whole relationship with the 10 year old uh, force. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So he, he said, uh, every time she'd put out these videos on her page, I'd be like, oh, my God, I'm going to get my ass kicked again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's starting to like anxiety. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so he, he uh, finally conceded defeat in his long running drum battle with 10 year old Nandy. Uh, and they've taken part in a series of back and forth musical challenges issued to each other. Um, and so uh, she, he said she's beating the crap out of her drum set. And when she does drum rolls, she screams, girl said in a new appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, uh, remembering watching the In Bloom cover that he did, that she did. Mm -hmm. uh, he, mm -hmm. he said, I was like, oh my God, this kid is a force of nature. Uh, there's nothing I could do. Uh, uh, he said, I was literally being called out by a, the school bully. Uh, I'll see you on the playground <laughs> after school. Uh, every yeah. time she put these videos on her page, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to get my ass kicked, kicked again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that, wow. it's, it's really enjoyable to see the back and forth between them. Yeah, that's great. I mean, what is, what a, we talked about this a little bit on the last part, I think. I mean, what a, what a wonderful thing to give to a child, right? Yes, I know. She's that's, um, one of the moments of her life. Yeah, one of the biggest moments of her life, I'm sure. I know. It's definitely a peak at age 10. I, I don't know. Yeah. But it's it's pretty amazing. So she's, and she's yeah. earned every bit of, you know, exposure that that's yeah. gotten her. It's yeah. Yeah. really good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't remember a single goddamn thing I did when I was 10. No. She will never forget. No, when she no, was no. 10. no. We can't forget that. So, yeah. Well, Jens, before we end, this being our Thanksgiving week pod, I do want to ask you, and your your wife put together a great activity last night of uh, uh, sharing what we're grateful for. So uh, Jens, what are you grateful for right now? Well, you know what? I'm not biased or anything here, Steve, but I am grateful for our pod together. Oh, me this too. This is fantastic. I mean, it really, really is. Uh, uh, you know, every show is different, you know, every show has a different dynamic, every show has different content, and it never ceases to, um, you know, continue to, you know, motivate us to continue to press on. I agree, I agree. It's a lot of fun. We're coming up on episode 300, and you've stuck around for the better part of 200 of those, and... Uh... That's unbelievable. Like, I can't even believe it's been that long. Like, wow, is it really yeah. that long? It's been, it's been a bit, you know, so I, I, give, you, I give you credit for, for sticking around too. And, uh, you know, it's a good way for us to catch up every week and uh, uh, and chat about music and whatever's going on in our lives. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's fun. So thank you for, for hanging through. And, and and thank you for allowing me to be your uh, your co-host. And um, you know what? Maybe someday we'll, we'll both have our little walkers together and we're like, mm -hmm. I've got to go get my podcasting equipment. What's Hold Dave Grohl doing this week? <laughs> Where's Dave Grohl? 
I lost my tennis ball. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay so, we're not stopping any tennis. Uh, but we will probably be taking a break for the, the holiday and uh, circle back when we have something new. So, um, right on. Yeah. And so I'm thankful for you as a good friend and uh, for this platform as well. Uh, and we're both safe in this crazy time right now. Right. And uh, we'll, that next year will be much better. So, um, here's hoping. Uh, Fingers crossed. That's our show. For, so for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, that's Jen Schippel. That's Steve Jones. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. We'll catch you next time.